This is Binod Shankar. You're listening to the Real Finance Mentor podcast from the realfinancementor.com. The Real Finance Mentor is your go-to resource for insight and inspiration on careers in finance, CFA, and more. I would think, why this podcast? Well, my goal is to deliver insight and inspiration for your finance career by making it one relatable. This is not theoretical stuff. We zero in on the critical, practical issues. Number two, authentic. No bullshit. No sidestepping. The topics, guests, and questions are all from that perspective. And number three, take a chartered accountant and CFA charter holder. Add 17 plus years as a corporate warrior. Mix in 10 years of entrepreneurship. Put in a decade of full-time CFA training. Add speaking, mentoring, cycling, and mountaineering. And that's me. Welcome to the Real Finance Mentor, or as I call it, RFM. Hi, everyone. This is Binod Shankar here, the Real Finance Mentor. Uh, the podcast that is meant to deliver insight and inspiration for your finance careers. And every time I bring on a special guest, someone experienced, someone who talks authentically and is concerned about uh, upskilling, employability, and how people can grow in their careers. Today, I have uh, one such special guest, and uh, she's quite senior. She comes from banking and financial services, and she comes with a very interesting background. Uh, born behind the Iron Curtain in a small Eastern European country, Bulgaria. Annie Filipova is an international banking executive with more than 25 years of banking experience. She's been with Citibank for 21 years, working in Bulgaria, London, Singapore, and Hong Kong in roles spanning product and relationship management, operations and risk and control. Her most recent job was a regional chief operating officer for Citibank Treasury and Trade Solutions in Asia. And she's now taking a sabbatical. So welcome to the show, Annie. Thank you, Vinod. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Now, you've traveled widely in your career and you told me that even as a kid, you wanted to go abroad. So where did you get this desire to go abroad and travel? I want you to explain this in the context of the young Annie Filipova in Bulgaria, pre and post collapse of the Iron Curtain, partly because I'm a, I'm a history buff <laughs> and the collapse of the USSR and uh, communism in Europe was, of course, a major turning point in world history. Well, interesting question. So as you said in the beginning, I was born in uh, um, behind the Iron Curtain. I grew up there and I get a lot of these questions. So how was your childhood? And people expect to say, oh, it was awful behind the Iron Curtain, but it's, it was not. It was, it, I remember only great, great time. Um, it was a great childhood. Uh, we didn't know what is behind the Iron Curtain and we were happy with what we were having. Um, I used to live in Sofia, which is the capital of Bulgaria. And um, every vacation that I would have, I would travel to my grandmother who was living in um, um, Southeastern Bulgaria. And I was there for the duration of the vacation without the parents, only with my sister and my grandmother and many friends. So it was great. Um, my grandmother, she had uh, um, in one of her rooms, the wall was all books. So um, I was reading a lot, um, not a specific genre, just whatever is there on the, on the shelves. And how it started is, um, so my two favorite books when I was a child was Carlson who, uh, from the Roof and P.P. the Long Stockings. And these books, you know, Carlson is from Stockholm and I had no idea where is this. And um, P.P. was talking about, uh, you know, Borneo and Kankata. And for me, that was sounding so mystical. And I was thinking, gosh, when I grew up, I want to go to these places. In addition, my father, my father was an engineer and she was, he was working on the tube, the underground, um, Sophie underground. So he was working with German engineers and um, they would come off to our house and they would bring these interesting things um, and snacks that we've never seen in Bulgaria, like Mars bars or um, lion bars or Haribo or, or chewing gums and and magazines with things that we've never seen in Bulgaria. So that was how, how it started, right? This is, this is how I said, okay, that the, the world outside is, is huge. And then I grew up, I read more. I was listening to Deutsche Welle, to Free Europe, uh, listening to music. Um, geography was one of my um, very um, uh, 
uh, favorite topics and subjects at school. So for me, Macau and Hong Kong was fascinating places. So I just really wanted to go there. So I guess what happened was that um, uh, all this one made me to, to see the world outside. And um, the, the Iron Curtain was keeping us on the lock over there in Eastern Europe. So again, I guess for me, that exasperated my desire to travel. This is how it started. It's always interesting, Anne, because whenever you look at somebody's uh, current hobbies or personality, you can almost always trace it back to their childhood, right? And what yeah. happened then? Totally, absolutely. Where else? <laughs> now, let, let, let's shift gears here. I mean, you achieved your career success at a major global bank, Citibank, right? Without an MBA or CFA or ACCA or any other fancy designation. I find this interesting because many youngsters these days believe that a qualification is absolutely essential for career success. What do you think are the three traits or skills that you think played the biggest part in your career progress? Okay, um, good question. So first of all, let me start with that, that I uh, never thought I'm going to be a banker. Um, as I just said, uh, travel was my passion. So I just wanted to work in a company, international company, which will help me travel. After I uh, graduated, and this is when um, it was um, 1992, that means Bulgaria just um, broke out of communism in uh, 1988. So it was opening, right? So there were international companies coming in Bulgaria, so I applied there. But unfortunately, everybody rejected me because they were looking for people who were experienced, uh, including Shell and McDonald's. I was heartbroken, but uh, I had to have a fallback scenario because I had to work. Um, and then I switched and started sending CVs to Bulgarian companies. And this is how I secured a job in a Bulgarian bank. Um, and I started in the sweep department. When I was starting work, MBA, CFA, and any of these didn't have any meaning in Bulgaria, or you had no need to have this. In all my um, other jobs in Bulgaria that I moved, uh, this was not part of the requirement. Um, and then when I moved to Citibank, um, all the internal postings I had were based on uh, experience. So MBA and CFA didn't play a huge role in my life. However, nowadays, things are completely different and um, MBA and CFA are a great plus when you apply for a job. But having these doesn't mean that you're going to get a job. It is it a fierce competition. And um, I, every year when I was the uh, CEO, I would be part of the management associate program and the intake interviews. And all these people had an MBA and CFA. And honestly, I was thinking if I have to start my career now, I would totally fail because these people are so much more, so much more knowledgeable and experienced than what I was then in that time. So I guess that explains why MBA and CFA didn't play a great role in my uh, career in the beginning. Um, when it comes to the three key qualities, um, so first, and I think the most important for me uh, that helped me all throughout, throughout my career was connecting with people, understanding what drives the people, um, how to help and collaborate. So um, this is what people remember, how you treat them. I have a genuine interest in people um, and I'm interested in all type of people, of all walks of life and um, doesn't matter where they are on the social ranking. Um, I'm just interested in them. And once you, um, when you have this interest in people, you start networking better and you grow your network, which helps you to find your next job. And uh, after that, all these qualities help me to be a good manager. The second very important one is working hard. Um, so for me, regardless of which job, maybe it's not your favorite job, but you always have to give 110% at the job because this is what is maturity. And working hard creates your brand as a trust, um, trustworthy employee. And every employer will listen to this employee. And uh, they, will, they know that you're reliable. Um, so 
this all this bring, brings you luck but luck for me is nothing else but hard but when hard work meets the opportunity so hard work is important and um, the third one is um, being intellectually um, curious changing wanting to learn you cannot st stay still the world is changing in a great pace you have to change with it so um, that's also when i started my career i wanted to to be a more rounded um, um, have more rounded experience so i started in operations this is before citibank then i moved to uh, front office client experience branch network i was even a, a head of hr at one point and then in Citibank, I was business head for uh, Bulgaria. Then I went to a product relationship, um, audit risk. And the most important thing is when I had to, um, my, the two important qualities that um, gave me the CEO job was the business knowledge and the risk knowledge. Interesting. Uh, I mean, it just shows how far you can progress in your career based on, like you said, the ability to be good with people and to work hard and smart and, and you know, just be curious and, and keep on learning, isn't it? Um, exactly. Now, let's talk about another aspect of your interesting career. I mean, you are a successful woman in finance. At the same time, mm -hmm. you have a family and you're raising two kids. Now, this is, of course, a challenge. It's a huge challenge that many women in the workplace have faced, are facing, and will continue to face. So how do you manage all this? And what were the highs and the lows? Thank you for this question. Um, you know, this is one of the questions that I, I get asked a lot. Uh, but I had a quite, a, quite a smooth sail. Um, with an occasional hiccups, but what you can't expect is that your life will go just like this without any issues. Um, and during my career, I never left um, any other way but respect, respected. And um, people treated me in line with what I was contributing at work. So um, I never felt like a second quality um, citizen, so to say. Um, I was promoted um, when I was eight months pregnant. So that was one of the promotion. Um, I was going to give birth and go on six months um, maternity leave. Um, but unfortunately, the more I speak with women, women, the more I understand that this is not what happens generally and to everyone. And um, once I returned to, to back to work after the maternity, it was um, a bit different because uh, on top of everything I had, I had to look after two kids. Um, I'm very lucky and fortunate and thankful that I have a very supportive husband who, who stepped in um, and um, he started managing work uh, life at home. So um, when I went back to the office and that's valid for every woman who comes back to the office after maternity, uh, we are faced with a completely different, actually not different, but unique um, things that we have to deal with than, than a man, right? So one of these unique things happens even today is that uh, your, every woman going back has to be very careful that her salary and her bonus is actually adjusted to her pre-maternity year. Otherwise, you start lagging behind uh, with, with everything because they compare your bonus increase to the previous year, which was your half year, right? When you're on maternity. Um, so, this also happened to me and it, it took several years for me to basically sort it out. And it's a um, very strange feeling to go and ask for something that you already had, right? Um, and, and pray for it. So once you have kids, you start wondering, um, why is it normal for the woman to, to live at six to be with the kids and not for the men? Why, why? Is it fair that men don't have the choice to stay home? Is it uh, less manly to actually stay home and look after your children? So all these questions and more um, made me um, work with the Women's Network at, at uh, my job. And I was mentoring a lot of women and girls, um, telling them what is it, how they have to plan their life 
for women who had um, are about to go on maternity, how to come back to work, etc. Um, so that's that's how I manage my life. Uh, but I will focus a little bit on uh, how I um, on my relationship with my kids because I think this is very important. And we women judge ourselves very, very harshly. Um, we just, um, I mean, we are working and um, sometimes we go out in the evening because we're tired and we want to have fun and we leave the, the, the children or the child with, uh, with, the, with the helper or with uh, the grannies and we feel so guilty. And we feel we are such bad mothers. But if you go by this logic, you would think that there are no good fathers at all, at all, right? So it's, it, you ha we have to be less, less judgmental towards ourselves uh, because we are good mothers. We are doing everything possible. Um, the second thing I have to say is that whenever I am with my kids, whatever time, 10 minutes, 15, 20, one hour, it doesn't matter. You have to devote 100% of your attention. You cannot just um, email and check your screen because then if, if you concentrate on your kids, they know, they know that they're your attention at this moment of time. Um, another thing I did, um, I explained my job to my kids and I explained why I work, why it is fun, what is happening. I have uh, taken them to the office on numerous occasions. And actually, this is one of the this was one of their favorite activities to go to come and have lunch with me or to go with uh, me to the office. That was big fun for them. Um, I never missed any uh, school gatherings, um, uh, any plays, any sport events, whatever is organized, whatever matters to them in their life. Um, and this is how they feel they're loved. And one of the very important things is demand your partner to help you because you are in this together. So these are my takeouts. This is how I managed to, um, you know, have a have a happy life mm. with a busy job, but also raising your family. I, I think what I find uh, helpful in what you just said now, Annie, is the very important role that both the employer and your partner plays in making life of a woman easier at work and at home. Exactly. Let's talk about uh, something that probably you and I share because I, once upon a time, used to be an auditor with the big four. Now, audit is often one of the least liked functions within a company because it's perceived as mainly being about finding fault and fixing blame, you know, and one of the unpleasant aspects of your job uh, in audit and risk review must have been deliver bad news to employees. So what are the three behaviors of yours that helped uh, in uh, being successful at your job in audit and risk review? Yes, yeah, uh, what you said is absolutely right. Um, no one likes the audit function, absolutely no one. But, you know, um, as I said, you have to give 110% in any job. So I did that, exactly that when I was in audit. And it gave me so many important lessons and it taught me so many things. Um, so, for instance, it taught me how to manage conflicts because in an audit function, uh, mainly you, you manage conflicts. Um, another thing is how to build a thick skin. Don't take things personally. And continue to strive in an environment where people generally are much more happy if, you, if they don't hear from you than when you he they hear from you. And I learned a great deal about city simply because I was traveling to, to city branches um, in Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia. So I created this amazing network and um, all this helped me uh, for my future. And as I said, um, it was one of the things that actually helped me get the, the CEO job. But there are three, um, three things I always did when I was in, in my audit job and that made it a bit easier. So the first one is to maintain a, no, a surprise free environment. So what I mean is that I, I keep my, the people that I audit um, appraised of what is going on. So they are not cornered in any meeting in front of other people because that's the worst uh, you can have. So open, um, honest communication. The second thing is listen to what people have to say, listen to as many as 
uh, employees want to contribute and say something about the issue because every opinion matter. And then the last thing is seek consensus because without consensus, um, then you, you leave a very negative connotation to anything you do. So this is, this is my, this is what helped me in my career in audit. I can definitely identify with your first point, Annie, about, you know, uh, no surprises and no one likes to be cornered, especially in a meeting in front of everyone, right? I, I remember early in my career as an auditor, you know, you're this young hot shot and you wanted to prove yourself and, and in quite a few occasions, I would send a draft report to the client, which contained some <laughs> surprise points and sometimes that popped up in subsequent client meetings. And it didn't always go well. In retrospect, that is a stupid move. <laughs> but you know, yeah. when, you're, when you're young, you do many such stupid things. Now, interestingly, in your conversation, you mentioned that you, know, um, you have visited city branches in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Now, as a result, in your career, Annie, you must have dealt with tons of people from different cultures, right? Eastern Europeans, Western Europeans, Americans, um, Arabs, Africans, Indians, Chinese, etc. Now, these days, youngsters must learn to work with global teams or in a global context in a multicultural environment, especially in a world where remote working is increasingly popular and prevalent and practical as well. So what were the challenges that you faced dealing with diverse cultures and how did you deal with these challenges? Um, I have to say that the multicultural environment is one of the best things in an international company and I, I, I love it. I, I like working with uh, so many different people. Um, and, and all these people give you a perspective which you would never otherwise learn and they have different approach to things. And that, that gives you a lot of things to think about and teaches you a lot of things. This is how you become better in inclusion and your ability to communicate. But I have several rules that I follow um, to navigate in a multicultural environment because it can be also a very dangerous one if, if you are not prepared, right? So, so the first thing for the countries where, which I would visit or um, if I know I'm going to work with certain people from certain cultures, I would pers personally, first rule is read and learn. Um, I would read about the country I'll, uh, and I want to understand what is the good behavior? How do I behave well and, good, and make a good impression? This is very important. And uh, once you know this, you have, um, you don't, you just look respectful and you look good. Um, and this should not be left to chance. You have to, you have to be prepared, you have to read. Then when you work in a um, multicultural team, um, there are people, with backgrounds that you have no idea about, right? You don't know where these people are coming from. So when you meet your team and, and work with people, you just have to first observe, uh, observe, listen to them, the, learn about them, right? W learn what makes them think, um, what, what, what do they, what they can think is good, what is bad, um, how they approach different issues and situations. Uh, don't judge them, just first, learn about them and then you get a better idea of how to approach them and how to collaborate for how to um, work better together and one of the best ways to learn more about people is the social gathering outside of work where people relax uh, you have a nice chat um, and and their cultural values come up and you understand who, who you're dealing with the second uh, um, and the last thing is um, Speak the language. So if you are in an um, international bank and the language is English, the worst thing that one can do is start talking with somebody else in their own language, right? This, this is what creates a um, negative environment. So you should use the, the main language. Don't make side comments on, on um, a language that only you and your friend knows. Um, so these are the three things I would say. But in general, in general, you should be willing to embrace other people and, and to, be, to be willing to learn about them. Mm. So, so to summarize, uh, basically dealing with other cultures, read and learn. Um, 
and we observe and learn as well. And the third point would be, you know, um, speak their language and, yeah. and don't be a foreigner. Uh, ma yeah. Makes sense. Now let's talk about something that people always talk about, which is bosses. Right? And you were once um, uh, a junior and you had bosses and then you became a boss yourself and led many big teams. Now the popular belief is that you should choose a boss over a job. Um, what's your view? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, I have a bit of a different uh, view. Um, I absolutely agree that it's great if you have the ability to choose a good boss, uh, but then aren't you missing um, on the, the, the best job you want, you're after, right? So I think the answer as usual is in between the two extremes. If there is a job that you absolutely want to do, if there is something that is going to add tremendously to your career, you should go ahead and take the job. But sometimes some bosses that are branded as bad, once you start learning about them, working with them, just see that they're not, not bad at all. Um, I had a mentor in London when I was in uh, City London and he told me, um, well, when I was talking with him about this job and that job, and he said, who is the boss is not the question you should ask yourself when you're looking for a new job. You should be asking yourself, how is this job is going to make me grow? How is this going to add to what I have already as qualities and how it is going to help me get on with my career the way I have planned my career? Bosses, he said, come and go and you learn from each and every one of them. And I remember this because it's so true. It actually that that will happen through, throughout my career so i had um, in my career many bosses some of them were good bosses some of them were exceptional bosses some of them pushed me to go um, to areas that i knew nothing about um, to challenge myself and they really made me grow um, and become what i am today and there were some other bosses who taught me um, how not to treat people how not to behave and what not to do if you want to have a happy, um, diverse team. So um, that's basically it. Um, and I use this, all this in all my career, throughout my career. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I look back on my own career, Annie, I think um, just, to, just to have my perspective is, I think my best jobs were where I had a good job where I was learning and growing and also where I had a good boss. But of course, it's not always possible to have both, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have good bosses, bad bosses and ugly ones, right? So, so let's talk about yeah. the last two categories uh, because working with a bad boss can be a horrible experience that can lead to, sure. among other things, physical and mental burnout. And many listeners of this podcast have and are probably going through this phase of their careers and they probably need some practical advice on this front. So I have two questions. So the first question would be, what was your mindset when, when, when working with bad bosses? Um, first of all, if, if first, first step is listen to the boss and understand where is the boss coming from. Actually understand what kind of person is that? What makes him or her tick? Uh, why is that behavior, right? And unfortunately, there are these bullies who progress in the ranks um, and manage people, and they should never manage people, but they somehow get promoted and supported by their bosses, and they will always be there. But if you're working with one of them, you observe that there is nothing that can be done. You get out of there as soon as possible. Find another job, another opportunity, and move on. Don't look back. I, nobody uh, should make you feel uh, worthless. Nobody should um, make you get into the depression or, depression or feel self-doubt. Absolutely not. You should have to get out. But sometimes, sometimes um, bad bosses, they also have bad bosses. And that actually makes their behavior the way it is, right? So it's not your fault that your boss can have a bad boss. But the thing is you can actually, by observing, learning, etc., you can help him and then 
indirectly help yourself to manage the situation. As I said, first and foremost, if you are in that situation where you think, okay, there's something can be done, the first most important thing is you do 110% at, at your job. So you should give absolutely nobody any reason to doubt uh, your commitment to the job. And that if, if the boss can change, then they can see you're reliable, trustworthy, things might change. Um, and also you delivering on your job gives you confidence, mm. right? That, that protects your um, mental health because yes, you deliver. And what are some practical ideas of what one can do? Um, so first thing is uh, if you have a, a micromanager, there is absolutely nothing more rewarding to tell the boss when he asks you, oh, where is this? And you say, oh, I already did it, it's in your inbox. So learn to anticipate and, and be always one step ahead makes miracles. It will take you a long way. Um, if you know what sets up your manager, just avoid that thing on any cost. Um, and one should always keep a positive attitude, right? I mean, polite and positive attitude inclusion is always makes good strands. You can rely on these things. Um, and now I'll finish with uh, another one, which I felt, which I learned from, from experience is be absolutely well prepared in meetings because there is nothing worse than being attacked in a meeting and, and you don't know your material, right? So not all relationship which start badly will continue this way. And sometimes you might create an amazing relationship with your boss. Um, and then continue with that relationship uh, all your life, right, with friends. So these things happen. You just have to see in which situation you are, the, the, the two situations I was talking about. I mean, in, your, in, in, some, in some statement you made earlier uh, today, you said uh, that you learn both from good and bad bosses, which I find quite an interesting perspective. And I wish I had that uh, mindset when I was dealing with a, a, a few bad bosses. Now, what did you learn, Annie, that you from, from bad bosses that you subsequently applied at work? Everything that I was talking about, I learned and then applied. So I was able to very quickly assess who is who. Uh, and that helped me actually collaborate with other people because it, you have difficult people to work with anyways, right? It's not only your bosses. So everything that your bad boss taught you, you can use. So you can distinguish who are these people and how to treat them because you've already had um, identified some, some ways to, to behave. So that's very helpful. You just apply every single thing in your career. Um, and also that taught me how to the, be, not to be the bad boss, but to be the good mm -hmm. boss, right? Always strive to be the good boss. You know what the good boss, how the good boss made you feel and you know how the bad boss made you feel. So you know what led to it, use it. Basically, you learn what to do and what not to do. Exactly. Which, of course, neatly segues to a related career um, uh, point, which is mentoring. Now, you've probably, Annie, mentored a few juniors, men and women, in your long, successful career working for a huge multinational bank. What are the top three traits or behaviors that you would look for in a mentee before deciding that he or she was worth helping? Yeah. Well, I, I love working with young people and starting professionals. I just really love it. Um, and what the first thing I look for is um, whether the person has a genuine interest to listen and learn. Because they're, um, they, should, they should want to really learn from you and they should have a goal they want to achieve. They should um, um, want to do that. Because there are some others who are choosing you just because they want uh, you to send their CV somewhere so, or to boast, oh, so-and-so is my mentor. Or, I would not uh, work with people like that. The second is um, I would prefer to work with people who are self aware and they know what they're looking uh, for. Um, so they know what are their pluses, minuses, what they want to achieve, what they want to take out of this mentorship. 
this is this this is the caliber of people I would work with. But also, uh, in some occasions, there are people, especially um, employees who come directly from school, they they just don't know anything, um, mm. and they need some guidance to, to find out what are their pluses, minuses, and where they should be going. I also work with these people, and these are very rewarding relationships also. And the third is. Um, I will repeat myself again, but uh, I'm looking for curious uh, people um, who are knowledgeable of the world around us, of the trends, of the inventions, the risks. Um, so it's always good to work with such people who are interested not only in the job, but how this actually impacts the world around us. This, these, are the, these are the three types of people I would work with. No, I agree with you. I also get approached a lot um, via LinkedIn, mainly by youngsters asking me to become their mentor. And my point is, uh, you should have the right attitude, like you said, curiosity, um, you know, self-awareness. You should have the right aptitude as well, um, you know, the intellect. And then I can I can guide you because guidance comes from experience and expertise. But if you ask me to hire you or forward your CV, then <laughs> I'm probably not the right person to contact. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Now, we've talked about your highs and your learnings and, but there must have been regrets, right? Uh, if you look back on your life, career, education, health, wealth, happiness, and other, what do you call, key indicators of career and life, right? What are your three biggest regrets looking back and why? <laughs> well, um, the first is I didn't take enough time with the children, even though um, I'm a very hands-on mom and um, even though I managed to see them for breakfast and dinner most of the days and that doesn't happen for a lot of parents, I still feel that I didn't have enough time with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no time enough with your children. That's my first biggest regret. The second is... I didn't, I didn't take good enough care of my body. Even though I'm in a pretty good shape, um, now that I'm in my sabbatical and I have more time, and given all the medical advances, I could have done better. I could have been healthier, I could have been fitter. And then the last one um, is, my regret is that I waited too long have kids and unfortunately my father never get to see them and because he would have been a, a great grandfather he he loved children so as you can see <laughs> these three uh, regrets have the common factor of busy job right mm -hmm. but thankfully um the first and the second were are correctable still correctable and that's why um, it's one of the reasons why I'm taking a sabbatical. Yeah, we will come back to the sabbatical yeah. point later during this interview. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this, it's never too late for most things in life, right? Uh, never too late. Better late than never. This is a Bulgarian saying. Now, you probably covered a few points earlier during this conversation, Annie. But I want you to sort of rephrase or repeat that in a way. What are the three career tips that you would give a youngster who is currently planning to enter or is already in the early stages of a career in banking and finance? Okay, that, that's a good question. And then that question I got asked a lot, especially by people on LinkedIn and young um, graduating students or young employees. Banking and financial sector is um, have been under transformation, new technologies, different and unique geopolitical events, COVID, all this had profound impact on banking. Banks at the moment are accelerating um, digitization, they're implementing new technologies, that means a lot of system changes, system setups, the banks are focusing on harnessing data, managing different new risks. So um, the business model is changing 
And we know that the way people work is also changing. So many, many moving parts. So I would say for everybody who starts a career now, they should expect a very dynamic and changing environment. And this is really to say the least. But um, I spoke about many things already, and I'll just add three additional things um, here for, for our listeners. The first thing is, I was just speaking about change. So be prepared for a lot of change and be prepared to embrace it and to run with it. Be adaptable, agile, be curious, ask a lot of questions, contribute. This is what every uh, employer would look for. The second thing is be digitally savvy. And uh, if you don't have an MBA, at least you have to be a master of Zoom because without that, you won't succeed nowadays, right? We are all on, on some digital means. Even now, together, we speak on Zoom. So um, you have to know all the gadgets and apps that will help your life and help your working life and make things better for you, easier for you, increase your productivity. And uh, the third one is, again, um, you have to master your ability to connect with people, work with people, not only in person, but also uh, digitally. This, this, is very, very, this is very important. Uh, and all this, obviously, uh, with a positive attitude and giving 110% of your work. Not an easy task. No, not an easy task at all. And a- I was just thinking of what you said, you know, be digitally tech savvy. And, but I think the last point connected with me the most, you know, master the skills to stay connected with people. Uh, not just online, but offline as well, because you can be digitally savvy and you should be with Zoom and yeah. Teams and Google and all those. But I think the human touch is so important and crucial for developing your career and so easy to uh, forget in these yeah. days of remote working. Yeah, it's always to forget and oversee, but uh, make no mistake, behind every technology, behind every AI is a person, right? Or people or teams, people, humans. Mm. So uh, your skills to connect with these people would will be what drives your career for sure. Mm-hmm. Right, so let me come to what was to me probably the most fascinating aspect of your career, right? You're now on a sabbatical since you've resigned from Citibank after what, 21 years of climbing the corporate ladder and I know you left as chief operating officer in the region. Now that is a highly unusual and gutsy move because you were a senior officer with a successful career in a global bank and most people in your situation typically work on till retirement. It must have been a carefully considered move. So why? Well, um, you know, when I was planning uh, for the sabbatical, um, I never thought it's gutsy or unusual, you know, never. But when I announced it, I, I, I actually found out that people do think that this is a gutsy and unusual thing. But it's fine. Right? It's fine with me because I, I'm okay with being different hmm. and gutsy in the eyes of the people. And um, it's not something that was difficult. It was not a difficult decision to make because that's what people ask me how can you make such a difficult decision but i'll explain my thought process right so so the first thing that started is when covid struck and we were locked at home um the kids were studying at home my husband was at home i was working from home and i suddenly had the glimpse of the life my kids and my husband has had while i'm at work which is like the whole day right um, we had breakfast, lunch, dinner together. We were chatting, talking about different things about life. And the more and more I was in that, the more and more I was thinking, I want more of this. I just want more. I didn't like to go back to the office and work, right? Mm. From there, I wanted to be with them. Um, when my kids were born, um, I was ready to become a full-time mom um, for a period of time. But... Well, at this time, my husband said, well, if you think, if you think I'm going to now cart 
my kid, your, our kids to different activities and become that parent? No, that's not going to happen. This was not a deal. Uh, but at the end, this is what happened, right? He took over um, and I continued with my uh, career. And I always, I was always jealous that he had the better part of the deal. I didn't get the, I didn't get the better part of the deal. So since I gave birth, I was just thinking about this, about one day I'm going to spend more time with, with my family. Mm. And this one day get postponed and postponed and postponed. And suddenly um, last year, my kids were 10 and I was thinking, that's it, right? That's my last train. They are going to be uh, 11 by the time I'm out on sabbatical. 12, 13, and they become young adults. They want to spend most of the time with their friends. That's my last train. I have to catch it. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to live with the consequences of not building this connection with my kids before they become young adults. And for me, that's that was very, very important. And there was no, nothing that could have stopped me, nothing. Um, the second reason was that, um, you know, the, the last six years of my career were, were so interesting, the most rewarding. I grew the most, I learned the most. Um, but in parallel, I developed a network purely intentionally, developed a net network outside the banking. And I started seeing entrepreneurs, um, scientists, journalists, and other people who actually uh, opened the door to a completely new universe, a universe that I didn't, knew, need, didn't know anything about. And that uh, gave me a lot of throughput up and opportunity. And I wanted to see um, other opportunities and see what else I'm good um, at. And I didn't want to miss on this opportunity. So that was my second reason. And the third reason, but not the, le the, the least, right? It's not in order of priority. I'm just throwing them out as they are. I definitely wanted to reset my body because, because we just uh, abuse our bodies on a daily basis. You sit in front of the PC, you know, we don't do enough sport and you're stressed. You have cost you midnight. Um, and you know, you, you can't rely that uh, you're abusing your body. So what do you think? It's mm. going to carry you through the old days uh, gracefully? Not really, right? So you have to stop, reset, rethink, get in better shape and see what's, what's next. So these are the three reasons why I decided to, to get on sabbatical. And it was a great decision. Mm. Quite, quite uh, a personal and quite a revelatory um, decision. In my case, I left corporate life about 12 years ago and it was push and pull for me. Uh, the push of the stress and politics and, you know, uh, uh, constraints and limitations of corporate life and the pull of the freedom and independence of entrepreneurship, right? I, I just crave to be my own person. I think uh, after a stage and after an age of life, you want to be in that phase is probably you know, where you are now, right? Now, you, you've left the hustle and bustle of uh, corporate life. You are now a free woman with so many possibilities. <laughs> I mean, this must be a trem trem tremendously exciting time for you. And I'm, I'm probably, I have mixed emotions of being envious and, and respectful as well at the same time of, of, of what you're going through. So what are your plans? Well, well, first of all, this is the best time of my life by far. Um, and I'm so grateful. And I just want to be healthy and my family to be healthy so we can enjoy this uh, as much as possible. Um, so there was many things, you know, I had, I had great plans um, and I spoke with many people before I went on, on sabbatical, but one of them told me, look, give yourself six months because now you're thinking one thing while you're still working, right? Mm -hmm. That you want to do one, two, three. But once you become free, your mind is going to kind of go in a completely different direction. 
just give yourself time and meet different people. So, so I followed this advice um, and what I did already, I, I managed um, a complete house renovation and I love um, architecture, the renovation, everything beautiful. So I have planned our house. I always wanted to do that. So now my next goal is to build a house from scratch. Um, one of the one of my long time interests, and I told you I'm generally interested in people. I just want to give back to to young um, or graduating students and to people who just start their careers, advice and everything I know. I am um, connecting with several university to, universities to, to teach practical things of, of working career, et cetera. So that's on the way. This is one of the key things I wanted to do. Um, I will also start a podcast, um, be a little bit like you, uh, but, and there are a couple of other things, but in due time, in due time. Preferential. <laughs> well, well, this has been an interesting conversation, Annie. I mean, uh, a lot of, I mean, both of us, I think, quite have a few things in common that helped. And we have covered a range from, you know, early childhood to education to getting a job, growing in a career, good bosses, bad bosses, <laughs> mental and physical <laughs> health, you know, women's issues at work. Um, and a lot of things I think which I which I think and I'm sure the listeners would find insightful and inspirational as well. Um, thank you so much, Annie Filipova, for taking the time and spending the time to um, you know go through the questions and you know uh, give very detailed and helpful answers. I'm very excited, as you probably are, at what lies ahead for you uh, during the sabbatical period of yours. Thank you so yeah. much. And I look forward to seeing your career uh, future with, uh, with considerable interest. No, thank you, Vinod Shankar. I, it's, it was such a great time with you now. Uh, you know, this, this podcast made me think a lot of things and um, clarify a lot of things. So it was very helpful for me also. And it, I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me at your podcast. Thanks, Annie. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. And keep in touch. Will do. Absolutely. The podcast is brought to you by The Real Finance Mentor. Thank you so much for listening. And I really hope you found it insightful and inspirational. If you did enjoy this episode, please drop us a review and spread the word. And be sure to check out more exclusive content on therealfinancementor.com and my LinkedIn profile, which is Binot Shankar CFA. Let's keep in touch. Just add your name to the mailing list on therealfinancementor.com and we'll tell you about new episodes, plus book reviews, upcoming events and blogs. Till the next time, onwards and upwards.